Hello, my name is Sciencebeard, and today I'm going to talk about something which was sent to me by the algorithm. Probably because of the eclectic collection of videos I watch, the algorithm thought I needed help and be freed from the human condition. I can't tell you how often I've used the phrase human condition. Literally, I can't tell you because I don't use it. I've heard of it in the context of theatre plays, Shakespeare perhaps, examining the human condition maybe. Anyway, this is science apparently and explains our behavior and everything. So let's dive in after this. So the way I'm going to approach this is a little different from my previous plan. Normally, I would look at the website and use their stuff to examine what they mean. But this time I will look at a transcript of something they recommend looking at first. And that is the interview. Luckily, there's a transcript, which makes my life easier. And even better, not only is it a transcript, but it has illustrations in it. I've never come across a transcript with illustrations in it, so this is exciting. If I was trying to convince people of something, which I'd found out, Personally, I would probably be quite humble and test it out against my friends' and family's views and then improve on it and present it after much deliberation as useful, maybe, or potentially important. This guy works differently. Jeremy Griffiths goes straight to world-saving. Wow. The interview, which is our starting point, is, we are told, redeeming, uplifting and healing. Now, it is important to recognize that this comes from a biologist. He's also Australian. Hmm, Jeremy Griffiths is a biologist, a scientist, and he is Australian. Why does this seem so familiar? Anyway, moving on. This is science and in no way to do with irrational beliefs. Jeremy Griffiths is a rational man, a scientist, a biologist. That is what is important here, and he can heal and redeem and lift us up. Against the fight that rages between good and evil. How very biblical? No, it couldn't be. I'm sure I'm just too cynical here. They haven't mentioned the Bible. They just want to end the turmoil and suffering. Sounds like paradise. Um, uh, although I'm sure that's just coincidence. Yep, coincidence. So I'm now moving to the video. I'm going to fast forward through some bits. Although I am also going to try and not strawman anyone here, so I'm going to use their words in context as much as possible. In this first bit, Craig Conway is introducing himself and repeating much of the initial blurb that is on the website and which I've already shown you. Hello to everyone listening. My name is Craig Conway. Now, whilst I've been an actor by profession in the world of film and TV and theatre over the last 30 years, uh, very recently I've been introduced to doing radio. Um, within this I've talked to people from all over the world uh, in all different kinds of trades and works and whatever, and it's been a very exciting and revealing opportunity for me to talk to people um, in a more in-depth way, if you like. So because of this, it's led me on a little bit of a journey to do a series of interviews um, with people who are out there in the world who are really trying to make a difference. Well, today I have a very, very special guest on the line from Australia. Now, during the turmoil and trauma of this virus pandemic, uh, it's only amplified the now dire need in the world for a deeper, lasting solution to all of the chaos and suffering in human life. And this deeper, enduring solution is actually what this biologist that I'm about to interview is going to provide us with. He's going to do this by explaining and solving the underlying cause of all the suffering, which is our good and evil stricken so-called human condition. So, I don't care what you're doing, you need to stop and listen to this interview. Unless you're doing something like driving a car or performing heart surgery, then please continue. In fact, I don't care what you're doing for the rest of your life. If you can, you just need to listen to this. Now, the interview is going to happen within four parts. Each is averaging around about 15 minutes, which is not a lot when you consider that we're going to be explaining the whole human condition. So, cool. We are several minutes in and we can look forward to a quick fix and then maybe some detail as how to do it. I hope this doesn't turn into a clickbaity sunk cost fallacy scenario. So it gives me a great privilege to introduce Australian biologist Jeremy Griffith. A special guest from Australia. Who is Australian? Why so familiar? He's the author of a book which is titled Freedom, The End of the Human Condition. And this is the book here. This is my copy, which I've had with me now for quite a long time. Uh, and I take it everywhere with me. And there are millions of people all over the globe who are currently studying, reading and researching through this book that Jeremy has brought to us. Wow, impressive. And clearly they aren't wasting their time. 
So a book which many people have all over the world and it follows them around and their life is influenced by it. The only other books, that, and this will make you laugh, that I know of which come even close to a description like this are <laughs> the, the Bible and the Quran. <laughs> so, I'm here to tell everyone that this book has not only blown me away and impressed me, but he has also impressed Professor Harry Prosen who is a former president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association. He's also one of the world's leading psychiatrists. And he said, I quote, I have no doubt that Jeremy Griffith's biological explanation of the human condition is the holy grail of insight we have sought for the psychological rehabilitation of the human race. But this is science. And there are eminent scientists like Professor Harry Prosen, who not only endorse it, but they came to it, right? They were convinced by the book and the writing in it, not the other way around. This is the book we have been waiting for. It is the book that saves the world. End quote. Now, I think everyone listening would agree that the psychological rehabilitation of the human race is exactly what this world needs. So without offering any further evidence, it is the psychological rehabilitation that we need. Hmm, interesting. So we are all sort of originally sin. Uh, I mean, we have this fundamental flaw in our psyche, right? So buckle into your seats. This is going to be the most interesting and exciting talk you have ever heard. I appreciate the safety advice and I'm now buckling in and, you know, getting ready for the talk of my life. So Jeremy, thank you for talking with us and tell us, how does your work bring about the psychological rehabilitation of the human race and end all of the suffering and strife and, as Professor Prosen said, save the world? Okay, after that intro, I certainly did not expect that. A, a, a ball of energy that he may be, but we will see. Thank you very much uh, for, for having me on your program, Craig. English is my second language, and normally when I slur my speech like that, I had a drink or something, but uh, let's get on. Finding understanding of our psychologically troubled human condition has actually been what the efforts of every human who has ever lived has been dedicated to achieving and has been uh, contributing to finding. Okay, this is a big claim. And what, prey is the human condition? You don't really say, which is odd because dickos like me simply don't know. I will, however, guess that you probably mean questions like, why are we here? What's it all for? What happens when we die? Where did we come from? And why me? Uh, as Professor Prosen said, finding understanding of the human condition has been the holy grail of the whole human journey of conscious thought and inquiry. Holy grail? Really? Not a scientific expression exactly. Although, hang on, that's it. It's just an expression, right? We humans have absolutely lived in hope, faith and trust that, that one day, somewhere, um, someplace, all the efforts of everyone, but in particular scientists, would finally produce the completely redeeming, and uplifting and healing understanding of us humans. Have we? Do we? Why do I need redeeming, lifting up and healing? I mean, sure, healing is good and uplifting is nice, but I'm... Um, not some contract colour out to soothe his conscience, as far as you know. Now, uh, I know it must seem outrageous, uh, outrageous to, to claim that, that this goal of goal has, goals has, has finally been achieved, but it has. In fact, um, the human condition is such a difficult subject for us humans to confront and deal with it that I couldn't be talking about it so openly and freely if it hadn't been solved. So your premise here is that we can't be frank about stuff until it has been resolved. In other words, until we know the truth, or there is an answer, or we know that there even is an answer, we can't bear to talk about it? That's pretty much the opposite to science, as far as I understand it, and my experience of it. Curiosity is what leads us to question things. It is in our nature. Otherwise, little children wouldn't stuff handfuls of sand in their mouth. Twice or two hot things, or spiky things, or ask questions. Not with you here, Jeremy. Okay then, Jeremy, solve the human condition for us. We're all ears. We're not all ears. We have other organs and tissues, 
Oh, I see. This is really just an expression. Sorry, please continue. Firstly, I'm a biologist. So you are a biologist. That does not mean everything you are going to say or do is rational. We have cognitive biases that certainly aren't rational. I mentioned the sunk cost fallacy or seeing patterns where there are none or the gambler's fallacy. All of these are not rational, but entirely persuasive to our brains and mind. Abstract things can also be rational. Freedom, energy, money, words even. Freedom is not a touchable thing. Neither is energy. No other shared belief in the value of money and words are an abstraction. Consider the letters B-I-B-L-E that spell Bible. Now consider D-X-R-F-G, which is gibberish. At least to me, probably means something in some language somewhere. And that's important because I think everyone will agree that what we need is a non-abstract, um, non-mystical, completely rational and thus understandable scientific, biological explanation of us humans. I also object to the word understandable in the context of scientific explanation. What I think Jeremy means here is intuitive, and intuition is very different to Russian. In order to understand science, you have to go back to first principles, examine, question, and follow the premises, and then you may understand. There's no way that you can tell somebody about quantum physics if they don't understand basic physics and then some. And anything quantum is certainly not intuitive or understandable. Doesn't make it wrong, though. Okay. So how are we to explain and understand the human condition? Understand why we humans are the way we are. So um, brutally competitive, selfish and aggressive, that human life has become all but unbearable. Bloody hell. Where do you live? I didn't realize that Australia was that bad. I was aware of poisonous things, sure. But I thought Aussies were all like, put another shrimp on the barbie. Which I always found an odd thing to do with seafood and a doll, but hey. In fact, um, how are we to make so much sense of our divisive behavior that the underlying cause of it is so completely explained and understood that, as Professor Preston said, the whole of the human race is psychologically rehabilitated and, and everyone's life is transformed. Yes, that's what we want. The human condition finally explained, fixed up and healed forever. Thanks for telling me what I want, especially when human condition hasn't even been explained yet. Exactly, Craig. So, to start at the beginning, I know everyone listening is living with the belief, well, well it's what we were all taught at school and are told in every documentary we watch, that humans' competitive, selfish and aggressive behaviour is due to us having savage, must reproduce our genes, instincts like other animals have. So he acknowledges that we are animals, and he says we are like them, and that some have competitive, selfish, and aggressive behavior. But there are lots of animals that don't display violent behavior, and even these are very limited, maybe to mating season or territorial behavior. It doesn't mean they all do, and we do. And what school did you go to? I've certainly not been taught that in school. And I've watched documentaries that do not imply we are governed by our animal instincts. Mostly I found that in monster movies. Again, I have to ask, where the hell do you live? And have grown up, gone to school. I mean, our conversations are saturated with this, this belief, with, with comments like, um, we, we're programmed by our genes to, to try to dominate others and be a winner in the battle of life. And... Uh, uh, our preoccupation with sexual conquest is due to our primal instincts to sow our seeds and, and men behave abominably mm -hmm. because uh, their bodies are flooded with must reproduce their genes promoting testosterone and, and we want a big house uh, because we are innately territorial and and, um, and fighting in war is just our deeply rooted combative animal nature expressing itself. And uh, uh, the most common comment of all, Craig, is that it's just human nature to be selfish. Whoa, there's a lot to unpack here. Firstly, those quotes are literally the worst examples highlighting appalling human behavior I've come across. Secondly, I've never come across them. There are some sentiments which people attribute to other people's behavior, maybe, but that is usually to highlight what dicks these people are which implies that those people have a or ought to have a better grasp on their own behavior, thereby making this sort of claim to universality a little nonsensical, no? And in war, there are actually very few people who enjoy shooting at enemies, and those that do are usually psychopaths. And also, 
Thanks for writing off and ignoring the acts of kindness of donating time and money to charity, taking and caring for refugees, granting asylum and condemning violence and other perfectly unselfish things that humans do. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. I mean, that really is what I've understood is the reason for our uh, competitive and aggressive nature, that we have brutally um, competitive survival of the fittest instincts, which we are always having to try and restrain or, or civilise or try to control as best we can. I mean, that's what I was taught in school. Yes, that's what we were taught. Really, Craig? You had to be taught not to go around killing people? Seriously, where do you people live? But let's think about this. And what I'm going to say now is very important, so I hope everyone's listening closely. Thanks for the reminder. Surely this idea that we have savage, competitive and aggressive, must reproduce our genes and instincts cannot be the real reason for our species' competitive and aggressive behaviour. Because, after all, uh, words uh, used to describe our human behaviour, uh, such as um, egocentric and arrogant, inspired, depressed, um, deluded, pessimistic, optimistic, artificial, uh, hateful, cynical, mean, uh, sadistic, immoral, brilliant, um, guilt-ridden, evil, psychotic, and neurotic, alienated, all recognise the involvement of our species' fully conscious thinking mind. They demonstrate that there's a psychological dimension to our behaviour, that we don't suffer from a genetic opportunism-driven animal condition, but a conscious mind-based, psychologically troubled human condition. Really? Feeling depressed never has a biological cause? So it shouldn't be possible to treat it with chemicals, surely? What about being inspired? Is that a conscious effort? Immoral? Morals vary from time to time and are judged by outside agencies, not just by our own consciousness. To some, eating meat is evil. To others, it is acceptable. To some, the death penalty is okay, while others abhor it. Arrogance is equally not something we feel ourselves, but we judge others to be. The claim that the mind is separate from the biology of the organism is an extraordinary one and would need to be backed up. And, and what's more, we humans have cooperative, selfless and loving moral instincts the voice um, or expression of which we call our conscience, which is the complete opposite of uh, competitive, selfish and aggressive instincts. Hang on a second. You are now claiming that we have moral instincts. Instincts are instincts and they are not conscious. They are certainly not separate. You don't think about instincts. You may justify or rationalise them in an ad hoc way, but that doesn't mean they aren't instincts. Next you are going to claim that this actually separates us from animals who... What, never display cooperation, love and affection? I mean, as Charles Darwin said, um, the moral sense affords the best and highest distinction between man and the lower animals. And of course, to have acquired these cooperative, selfless and loving moral instincts, our distant ape ancestors um, must have lived cooperatively, selflessly and lovingly. I mean, otherwise, how else could we have acquired them? Yeah. Our ape ancestors can't have been brutal, club-wielding, competitive and aggressive savages as we've been taught. Rather, they must have lived in a, in a Garden of Eden-like state of cooperative, selfless and loving, innocent gentleness. Firstly, you do claim that now. We are in fact unlike other animals. But then you say that our ancestors were not only quasi-incapable of aggression, but lived in a Garden of Eden-type state. Eden? Really? You ask how we could have acquired those instincts which make us capable of selflessness, cooperation and love. How about evolution? Simples. Natural selection selected for individuals that don't go around killing their own kind indiscriminately and maybe even help each other. And who told you that our ancestors were aggressive and brutish? Again, where do you live? Which, um, as I'd like to explain uh, uh, to you, uh, Craig, in this interview, um, is, a, is a state that the bonobo species of apes is currently living in, and which uh, anthropological findings now evidence uh, we did once live in. For instance, um, anthropologists like uh, Owen Lovejoy are reporting that um, our species-defining cooperative mutualism can now be seen to extend well beyond the deepest Pliocene, which is well beyond five million years ago. So we have, and we are capable of supporting each other. That doesn't mean there aren't always going to be dicks, or that individuals under stress make the wrong decision, or that people who take an action will not later be judged to have taken an immoral one, depending on context. 
So, so saying our competitive and aggressive behavior comes from savage competitive and aggressive instincts in us is simply not true. As I'd like to, to come back to shortly, it's just a convenient excuse we, we have used while we waited for the psychosis acknowledging and solving real explanation of our present competitive and aggressive human condition. Wow, so that's a pretty big statement, Jeremy. Oh, Craig, it's also bollocks. In some circumstances, tribal behavior, which, when seen from the outside, can be judged to be immoral, is nevertheless explainable by fairly trivial factors such as access to living space, food and mates. And that's why we have different levels of accountability. Pre-planned murder is seen as more heinous than murder out of passion. This has already gone on too long. We're well into 20 minutes, so I'll pick that up later. See you in the next one. Bye.